You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405. We've got a great conversation today with a young fellow who is making it big with his new book that's coming out right away. It's Rick Gerard, author, consultant, and great all-around guy. So welcome, Rick. Thank you for having me, Will. I've not, I haven't been called a young guy in a long time, so thanks. I appreciate that. Well, that's right. That's right. There are some guys who are younger than I am. I don't know if I'm well, – I'm not that far behind you, my friend. I mean, we have the same haircut, right? So, so That's right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. That's right. All right. So, uh, so you got this new book, Healing Career Wounds, right? Yes. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little sample of it. It comes out on May 20th. All right. And, All right. Uh, so tell us about a, it. It's a startup's guide to attracting, hiring, and retaining ridiculously successful people. So what I found through my uh, search business, uh, my, my company does executive search, was uh, the biggest challenge that we've had is that entrepreneurs and hiring managers uh, really don't know how to even interview people properly to, uh, to extract the right data to support whether or not they should make a hire. And so we started kind of developing a system over the past, well, it's evolved over the past seven years or so. And, um, and that's what we kind of bring to our, um, the value that we bring to our clients is that we, we provide the search, but we also provide the coaching and the uh, kind of building of an interview process for them. All right. Anything else you want to talk about the book right now? Um. No, it's just, you know, it's right. designed for if you're a startup executive or, or an entrepreneur, it's for you. All right. So I'm setting you up. Okay. I'm going to get some free consulting from you for one of my clients right now, right? I'll take it. Let's go. All right. So here's the setup. I was with him this morning in a, in a group of people, and uh, he, is a, a, um, he is a financial advisor. Okay. And, and he is, you know, he worked with one of the local financial advisory firms and he was got sick and tired of always feeling like he was being pushed to sell the most expensive product, regardless of whether it would help the financial uh, stability of the client. Right. Sure. He also said, you know, if I were on my own and had my own company, I could increase my, my revenue by 30% just because I wouldn't have to pay that to the sponsoring broker. Fair? Sure. All right. So here he is. He's, he, he's there, and, and he said, I want to hire at least two. I want to bring on. He's not hiring. I want to bring on in a relationship with me at least two financial advisors, maybe five, by the end of this year. Okay. All right. So we started talking with him and said, well, what are your core values? I mean, it's good EOS. You know, several of us in there highly invested in EOS. And, and so we said, what are your core values? He worked them through. It has to do with things like putting the client first, um, you know, uh, helping the client be ready to retire, not only with money, but also with projects that would carry him through the rest of his life. Right. So good core, good core values got them listed out. And then we said, all right, now, what do you want this person to do? So give us the five, the five, uh, tasks that are in the accountability box. So he hadn't thought about that, but he began to lay that out. And then, then he said, you know, the next question was, well, how do I go re recruit them? So we talked about that. Now let's suppose that he does what, well, you know, that he does what he said he would do, which is to get LinkedIn going, get his, all of his recruiting uh, machine working. And, and there's like, you know, four or 5,000 potential candidates out there. So let's suppose he starts getting candidates in. What does he need to know about how to interview them? Okay. So I, I'm going to take you back a little bit because uh, first off, you, you have to have a solid foundation before you start, you know, just interviewing and, and hoping that you find the right person. So, um, you, which is great. You had them define out the core values, right? So that's perfect. Now, uh, what you do is you take those core values and you break them down even deeper. And number one, you build those into behavioral interview questions that are designed to 
expose whether or not somebody has those same values, right? Okay. First and foremost, the one of the most uh, one of the most uh, contributing factors to a successful hire is whether or not somebody aligns with the organization from a values perspective. So you want to make sure that you have those. Second off, when you go back to the job description, uh, the job advertisement that you're going to put out there in a job description, you can, you can have them as one document, but you have to keep in mind when you put together a job description, it's a marketing document. Um, the, the one that you're putting out to the public is a marketing document. And so you want to design it to where it's going to attract the right people and repel the wrong ones. And so the two things that you want to put in the job description are number one, you, you know, you broke down that he put together what he wants this person to achieve. I would break it down to quantifiable oh, performance, yes. performance yes, we metrics. Did. He did. Yeah. Yep. Quantifiable performance metrics that that are broken down for the first 90 days, mm-hmm. then 120 days, and then, you know, at the one year mark so that somebody right. knows exactly what they need to achieve. Mm-hmm. And to get it a step further, now you've got, now you can put that out to the public. Before you put it out to the public, the last thing that you need is a call to action. So you don't want just people to send their resumes that are kind of no brainer resumes. You want people to respond who, who actually resonate with the content of the job description. So what do you do? You put a call to the action at the end of it. You have them answer a couple simple questions and you put a, not a guarantee, but a promise that if they if they give you great answers to those questions, that you're going to give a, you're going to get a response. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you put that out to the world, that gets rid of the, a lot of the people that will just send their resumes in. They, you know, unfortunately with job seekers, a lot of times there's just this attitude of, well, I'm just going to send out a ton of resumes and hopefully I get something. You definitely want to avoid that. Um, now, if he's putting it out to LinkedIn, best thing he can do is target like find an avatar person and target 10 to 15 people that he wants to talk to and then reach out to those people and have a conversation with them. And, and not to plug the book, but you know, I've got full scripts in the book as to what you say to people when you network, when you get referrals and when you actively just go out and cold recruit people off of LinkedIn when you have these conversations initially, I call that a discovery call, right? So what you want to do is you want to understand how a person is positioned in their career and their life. What that means is, you know, uh, there's kind of three pillars to it. There's the pain, like what pain are they feeling? Why are they interested in making a move? Why are they talking to you? Uh, what they desire is the second one. So uh, I want to get a picture of what somebody really wants from their career independent of me telling them anything about my company, right? And then I want to understand the impact they've made in their current organization so that I get a, a really good sense of what they've done. Because, uh, you know, a lot of greater men than me who have come forth have said, you know, past performance is a key indicator of future performance. And so you want to look for evidence on that side of things. All right. Yep. All right. Now, when let's suppose that you're in the place, and I think that the way that this fellow is using is is setting it up is he's not asking for resumes initially. Good, don't. He, he's he's what he's asking for is it's going to be along the lines of making contact with some of these four thousand potential hires and um, potential candidates, and and when they contact when when he makes a contact, then at some point early in the conversation, he's going to say things like. When I was uh, back working for one of the major financial advisory firms, I got really tired of having to give up over 30% more of my, you know, the, just a huge amount of money I had to give up to my firm just for the privilege of working there. And, and, and you know, also I, I, got, I got frustrated because I always felt pressured to sell uh, products that I would make a lot of money and the firm would make a lot of money but it wasn't necessarily in the best interest of the client. Now I'm looking for a couple of people who feel like that. Do you? Well, so I I don't like that. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, Number one, you're feeding somebody the answers. So, you know, somebody who's intuitive is going to be like, Oh yeah, I absolutely feel like that. Right. But when, when you ask somebody, okay, 
you're also kind of making it when you talk about the money, it's transactional. So money is important. Obviously we all work for money and that's the reason why, I mean, that's one of the things that, that is, that is the benefit, but, but the reason why most people are looking for something new or looking to move isn't necessarily the money. A lot of times it's the lack of growth. um, It's the leadership or it's even the, um, the content of the work. They're just bored of it. Right. And money uh, should not be the main factor as to why they're going to move. Right. And if that is the main factor, that's not a good career wound. That's not a good reason for somebody to look. I advise against that. I, so, so for me, like you're better off having the conversation. So if you were to be able to kind of, you know, create your own opportunity from scratch, what would that look like for you? And I want to get them telling me what their vision for a successful uh, jump is going to be. And that's, that's really the most important thing because now I'm not, I'm not adding any of my own personal content into that, that the person's, you know, dropping what they feel is going to be the most accurate data to get me interested. All right. Now what this fellow is offering in his firm is uh, the opportunity to put the client first and, and, and one of the, one of the, 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 the qualifying pieces for him is somebody who agrees with that. Okay. Then somebody right, so, will tell you that. Then somebody will usually tell you like, Hey, look at, I'm at a firm. Here's the problem. I'm forced to sell product, you know, da, 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 da. Okay. You know, they'll feed you that on their own. Well, our, our, Oh, okay. All right. Well, all right. So then how do you get the conversation? I mean, we've got 4,000 people out there, assuming they're all on LinkedIn. Uh, you're targeting them. What, what's going to get them to have a conversation with you? Okay. So uh, first and foremost, I would say don't target 4,000 people. Well, no, no, no. I, but I, I, I target, out target of that. 10 at a time, right? Right. Um, okay. But what's going to get them to want to talk to you? So, I mean, number one, you could, you could either like call people, pick up the phone and call people. I mean, you know, I got Gino Wickman to write the forward for my book by me cold calling him. I just gave him a call and said, Hey, look at, I'm a big fan of traction. Can you look at my book? And, you know, would you be open to, to doing a, a forward for my book? There's no harm in call, you know, picking up the phone and calling people one, um, two, you message them. You know, if you're not comfortable doing that, send them an email or message them through LinkedIn. And again, I, you know, I would, I would caution against selling your company in the beginning, but you know, you, you want to deal with the human element first and that's them. Nobody really cares about your company, what you have to offer. They don't care about you. You know, they care about themselves and they care about like healing whatever pain they have. Right. So you just got to be able to poke that and get them interested. All right. So now you're, you're through the discovery call. What's next? At the discovery call, you're going to have a pretty good reference point. You're going to see that somebody's positioned well for your organization. So what they desire you have to offer, the content of work, you're going to mentally be kind of thinking about, well, what kind of growth do I need to provide this person or what are they telling me they want? And then afterwards, you just kind of connect the dots and you let them know, hey, look, at here's where, here's where we mesh. You know, here's, we offer this, 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 and this, and this is about the opportunity. Um, Here's where we don't. Uh, This is where a lot of companies fail. They try and paint this picture that you have some uh, utopian environment that's, that's, you know, perfect. But everybody knows that no matter what, every company's got problems. And and a lot of people, the right people will thrive with those problems. They'll want to be part of that. Then you kind of connect the dots. That goes well. Then you bring them in for an interview. And as I mentioned earlier, you want to, you want to pre-assess interview questions. So, you know, we have it broken down into, you do a a cultural interview first, and that's taking two of your cultural values. You develop questions for them. One of them is a knockout question you're going to put in there. So you only need about 45 minutes and, um, and four questions, one of them being a knockout. If you get through three, great you're getting a lot of good data out of that conversation. What and do you again, mean? Not, what do you mean? Knockout? 
So a knockout question is something that is, it's a non-negotiable for a company. So your corporate, your, your, your values have to align with that value, that specific value. So for example, um, uh, I learned this actually from another company, Craig Cook as the CEO of Craig had a knockout question where they would ask everybody, which was, you know, do you consider yourself to be lucky? Which is a cleverly disguised question to understand somebody's attitude. So, you know, you get people that'll say, no, I'm not really lucky, but I'm fortunate. I feel like I'm blessed. I'm, you know, and they feel grateful and they have a positive attitude about it. Then there's some people that just outright say, no, I'm not lucky at all. Like every time I go outside, it rains. Um, if I go to Vegas, I lose money, right? And that would, that's how a dark cloud follows me around all over the place. Exactly. Exactly. And that's not somebody who does well in their organization. That's a knockout question. That's something that's non-negotiable. It's usually pretty easy to find. It moves somebody through to the next step. So the second step would be a skills assessment. Um, we do them in the form of a working session. So you'll get two or three people together and you'll work through a problem which is a really good way to understand somebody's depth of what they know. And it's also a really good way to understand how they collaborate and how they work with you. So you're getting a really good snapshot of that. And then uh, finally, you'll do another cultural, followed by maybe a fourth cultural, depending on the organization and, and where they are. And then from there, you, uh, you make a decision. And usually when you get to the end of this process, it's, it's a fairly easy transition to a decision and an offer. Somebody makes it through, boom. Somebody doesn't uh, make it past the first knockout question, then you let them go and you look for, you keep looking, right? Oh, how many, how many should, uh, you know, a, a small company, you know, it, it's, uh, I think it's a startup. Uh, uh, how, how many should they have in the funnel? What, what should we, you know, that look waiting for the first conversation? find it a big waste of time when people put job ads out there and then they get really, they're really excited about the fact that I've got 80 resumes to look at out of those 80, probably three are appropriate at most. So like, you're not really attracting the right people, number one, but I'm a big proponent of like, be a sniper. You know, the most effective person in the military is a sniper, not a person with a machine gun. So why don't you just target people specifically? Like I said, just pick off a few people and then bring them through the process. They'll, they'll weigh through pretty clearly in the phone conversation in a discovery call. You'll be able to understand whether or not somebody is in alignment with you and whether or not you bring them through the interview. So you can talk to 15 people in a discovery call, you know, maybe bring one through to an interview to a hire. But again, you're not bringing them through an entire interview process. They're, the, the other challenge that you have is that, you know, you don't have the time to sit down and actually interview 15 people right, right. to make one hire, especially if you're a startup. You need to be working, generating revenue. You got to value your time a lot more than that so that the people that you bring into the interview process are positioned correctly. So uh, let's assume for a moment that we use LinkedIn. Yep. And our target market is uh Orange County in San Diego County, mm -hmm. uh, financial advisors four to six years in. And I, I think on LinkedIn, you get 10, five to 10, uh, but that's, that's who we're looking for. So we search for that and we come up with, you know, a, a lot. So would we just kind of uh, pick, you know, go through and let our intuition point us to, to, you know, five or five to call this week and do, you know, would do a, are you interested call? So why four to six? I don't, four yeah. to six years. Yeah. Because that That's the belief that this, uh, this fellow has based on research. That's when that financial advisor, 90% of them don't make it. And they don't make it in the first two or three years. So sure. if they've made it through four years, they've got a book of business. They know what to do. We're not going to have to teach them how to be a financial advisor. And then it, over six, they tend to have already made a decision either to be on their own or to stay with the company forever. So that's what he's looking at is that that's one of the things that his research has told him to look for in uh, the financial advisors that he's looking for. 
So I tend to be one of those people I question everything. I go, okay, well, you know, okay, if everybody's looking at the four to six year, why, why don't I look at the two to three and the 10 year plus? Because nobody's really reaching out to contact those people. Um, I don't think that he's going to be chasing the same people that everybody else is chasing that's trying to get financial advisors. That's the, you know, I, I do a lot in engineering uh, software development. And I will tell you that everybody wants that four to six year person, you know, under 10 years, somewhere in there. They're just getting hammered all day long. But you know who's not? People in our age group, as my friend Kelly Robinson calls us, the modern elders, right? Or um, or the kind of more up and coming ones that that are uh, that aren't really quite there yet, but they feel like they're probably maybe the right person in the wrong seat. All right. So all right, the good that's good data. Whichever way this this person decides to go, yeah. he's got a target market. Sure. All right. So he's got the target market. And it's going to have multiple thousands of people on it looking yep. through LinkedIn. Now, what do I do next? Do I go through and just randomly or use my intuition, pray about it, pick out five? Specifically just going off LinkedIn. I mean, well, that's what that's all, what he's using right now. He's not he's not going to be using yeah. a he's not going to be calling you up and asking him to hire folks for him. No, no, no. But that's OK. But what about using his network and referrals first? Because that's usually your best source of talent. So he should be utilizing his network and getting the names of people who are strong at what they do. So not not people that are looking for a job because you don't want those people. You want the people, you know, call up your buddy Bob who works at some other company and say, hey, Bob, who do you think are the three strongest, you know, X financial advisors that you know, right? And then just write down those three names. If you can get their phone number or anything like that, Call up Bob's friend, Jerry. Call up whoever you can and get the names of the, the people that you think are strong. Start there. Now that you've got this list, you could probably go then go back to LinkedIn, find out who they're connected to, and then connect the dots from there. So it, it requires a bit of research that you're going to have to do. And, a, you know, it's a good activity for a Sunday night or, you know, uh, right before work. But, but, yeah, you know, find out who they're connected to, who they recommend, and then when you start talking to people too, if they're self-selecting out, so if they don't, if they're not positioned correctly, so for example, he's a startup and they say, look at, I just want to get into a large financial institution where I can coast for a while and I don't have to worry too much about anything. I don't mind giving up most of my profits, self-selecting out, right? So then right. all you have to do is, look, I totally get it, man, we're not on the same page. I'm not going to try and sell you on anything. However, who do you feel is like, or are the are the top three performers that you know, you know, in your network, and just get names. You're not asking for anybody, and you know, would it be okay, okay if I use your name to introduce myself? If not, I can totally leave your name out of it. But what you're doing is you're gathering data on who's good, and uh, and then you kind of go from there. Yeah. And that yeah. that 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 call to to who's good is going to be somewhere along the lines of. Uh, Rick George suggested I give you a call or uh, your name came up several times in a conversation and I wanted to talk to you. What? Yeah, you can What's start next? it. Yeah, you can start it out that way. Um, you know, I always like leave it super open. I just wanted to find out really quietly if you'd be open to hearing about a situation that could potentially be career advancing for you. Okay. And then shut up. <laughs> You know, hey, yeah, I might be open. What do you got? Well, you know, before I kind of delve into why I called you, I wanted to find out a little bit more about you as a person. So what's happening in your current role that has you open to hearing about something potentially stronger? And then I'm going for the pain point. I'm trying to learn what's happening with them personally and professionally now. So in a real sense, this is uh, this is. Um you would this is is a, a it's really a form of uh, of uh advisory kind of selling yeah 100 percent. yeah because i uh, you know again you don't want to sell product to people i mean you're selling your company right but you're not you don't want to sell to people that aren't positioned right for it um the worst thing you can do i i, I see this all the time where people you're you know they're chasing somebody out of a name brand company like a google or facebook 
because they really want them because they think that person's going to do wonders for their company, but that person's not positioned properly for the company. The person's happy doing maintenance. They're not somebody who's going to come in and build something for you. So, you know, you got to be, you got to be careful of that. That's the one thing that can get you into a lot of trouble. You're taking the initiative uh, to call people who've been, could be referred to you, but uh, it's it's a it's a list of people who who've been you've been given a list by other people who said this might be somebody to talk with. Yeah, right. It, it, it's yeah. not that he's necessarily heard that other person saying I'm looking for a job, but these are these are high performing people. You do, high performing people are the people you want to hire. Number one, <laughs> right? And they don't ever they're not looking for jobs. You know, it's sad to say, but they're not on job boards. You know, you may occasionally get a high-performing person who comes home on a Friday night. They put their kids to bed, and, you know, they're like, man, this is a horrendous week. Maybe I'll just look on Indeed or something and see what's out there, right? If you've got a great job description, something that's a really good marketing doc, then you can attract that person. But if you don't, if it's like everybody else's job description, you're not going to. You know, they, they might apply to the Googles or the big companies, but that's really about it. But they're not actively out there looking for a gig. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, we want to make sure that they fit our core values. So when we're, we're in that cultural conversation with them, what, what are some ways uh, to dig down, you know, so we don't wind up 90 days later discovering they, they really – we're saying yes to all the cultural value questions, but they're really a no. Okay, so I, I gave you an example of that one question. So behavioral questions are, you know, walk me through a time, you know, for example, walk me through a time when somebody asked you to lie, right? So you might be, you might have integrity as one of your key uh, core values, right? And so let them walk you through a story and you dig deep under the hood and you figure out like, you know, what motivated you to, to do that and how did you feel about it and why did you go along with it? And, you know, you just kind of uncover uh, this, this, the onion, you unpeel the onion to figure out like really who is this person when it comes to integrity through this question. And so I'm getting a real life uh, example of something that happened, how they handled it and why they handled it that way. Again, that goes back to that past performance is a key indicator of future performance, right? So you, you may get somebody who's like, hey, look, at, I get asked to lie all the time. My company wants me to falsify documents all the time. I do. It's part of my job. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? I'm totally okay with it. I don't care. So, you know, if something goes down, it doesn't come on me. It goes on somebody else. Um, is that integrity that you want in your company? If we've got three to five core values, should, should we have at least three to five questions, one for each? Um, so we build out a library, we build out like four for each one, right? Each core value. And then we, we kind of distill it down more. So we have a core value question library, uh, for each one. And then you kind of pick and choose where you put them into it. So if you're evaluating for like, for example, you might be evaluating for value number one and two, I'm going to take value three and five, right? Uh And then somebody else is going to get four and six. So it just breaks it down. And so we understand like really uh, we, we have a lot of, we have no repetitive questions, right? But we have a lot of really good data to make a decision on. Good. Uh, it sounds to me like you've got a system worked out that, that will, has a high probability of producing somebody that uh, is the right person, as we say in EOS, and, yeah. and will and, and be in the right seat. That that's the whole that's the whole goal, right? Like startups are my people, right? You know, it's all about uh, building a company that you can, you know, you don't have to do all the work and in, in surrounding yourself with people who get it. What does Gino say? Get it, want it, and have the capacity to do it, right? And mm-hmm. so that's really what you it's what you need in your organization. The worst Go thing ahead. you do is hire for skills, you know, like and that's what yeah. we all tend to do. Yep. Yep. What would you suggest that people do when they when they have something who's not in the right seat? They're not a hire. This has already been there. And they're just not fitting into the core values. Well, not fitting into the core values or 
So, I mean, look, you gotta, you gotta take your time hiring, but is it hire slow, fire fast, right? So I think as you put it so eloquently, you want to release them to the market. You know, you have a, you have a great conversation with them and go, Hey, look at, you know, people will self-select out and nobody wants to lose a job. But the fact is, if they're not happy, then they're not doing themselves any service and they're not doing you any service. You want to, you want to keep them happy. You want to be happy. And, and you know, you don't want somebody who's going to drag down the business, which is the most important piece. Well, part of that, uh, part of that seems to me that that's going to come up over and over every quarter, at least every quarter in the, the all company state of the business where somebody's standing up and talking about those core values and, and maybe even picking out some examples of where people have lived those out uh, in, in the company over the last 90 days. And then as well in the uh, quarterly conversation that each manager has with his direct re- or her direct reports, they're going to be talking about those core values and what they see and how they share with each other. And so, uh, you know, that becomes a very important part of how you build the culture in the company. Yeah, it's super powerful when you have that language around how decisions are made and how we treat each other and how we how we just genuinely work, right? And how we treat our customers. I think that's you know, when you when you can create that, uh you'll create a brand that people will want to come to and won't want to leave. Well, let me ask you, when you're dealing with a company, probably not a company running with EOS, because if they were, they already have their core values. But let's suppose you're working with a company. They want you to come in and help them hire, and they don't have core values. What What do you tell them? So I work, you know, about 50% do and 50% don't. When I found that probably 50% of those 50% they do, they're not accurate core values. So we have conversations about it, and we sit down and go, okay, well, look at, I mean, this is the way our process works. And if it works for your organization, if you guys really are a values-driven organization, then we can help you. If not, then we can't. You know, our system works because it's so rooted in that foundation. Mm-hmm. And that's and if you don't have that foundation or if you don't know who you are and you're that connect, disconnected from your company, then, you know, get some coaching, do something to kind of fix it, or just stay with doing what you're doing. Right. Call, call up an EOS implementer and and talk to them. At least talk to them. Yeah. Right. Because that's 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 a big piece. It, it's without without a core values, it's hard to imagine a company being unified with purpose. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, look, you have to own who your culture is, and and I kind of say it every once in a while, like it it whatever your culture is, just own it. Like if you're a bunch of like hunters who are backstabbing and it's every man for itself. And that's your culture. Make sure you hire people that align with that. That's right. But it, 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 in an EOS engagement, they would be identifying that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're hard chargers. Uh, we don't go home until we got the job done. Uh, profit is the most important thing for us. Yep. Okay. 100%. That's, that's going to attract people who you want to be around. And it's going to repel people that you don't want to be around. Yeah. You know, those namby-pamby people talking about the customers, uh, how, how good they, you know, their values and what we need to de- sell them the stuff. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a real culture. Exactly. Exactly. As long as you're in it. Where you get into trouble is when you hire somebody that doesn't at all align with it. They just have skills that you're looking for. Right. And then and they come in and now you've got all kinds of issues and you probably have you know, potential for lawsuits, right? Oh, for they're going to be chipping away. They're going to be chipping away at the company all, every time. Chip, yeah. chip, 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 because, oh, you know, that's not good. We shouldn't be doing that. And and that works for whatever kind of culture you have, right? If yep. you have misalignment with culture, that's what you're going to feel. 100%. 100%. All right. Okay. Well, that, I think that's helpful. Uh, what I'm going to do, Rick, is I'm going to take this, this, uh, this initial unedited uh, video. I'm gonna send it right over to my guy and and let him take a look at it. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, but now let me ask you, uh, how would you feel if I sent him the uh, the the pre release copy to take a look at of the book? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I actually have a newer version, so let me send that over to you because it's got okay. some visuals that we put in. We did a um, a flow chart of it, like what the higher OS system looks like. So it's right. a little bit it's it's a little bit more 
Like you can get, you can visualize it now. So excellent. Excellent. Happy Your proven process. Yep. Proven process. Absolutely. Get that in. That's a lot. You and, I are, you and I are both process boys. That's right. I found that out when I, when I was right. I told you when I was writing my book, that's when I had the big aha. Get that book written in, in, in three weeks because I had a system. <laughs> God, I wish it was three weeks. It took me three years. <laughs> well, you got a big book. I got 60 pay. I got 10,000 words. I got a big deal. This is just a bunch of stories. That's all. Uh, now, all right. So show us your book again. Tell us how to get it and what you want, what you want these people to do who are struggling with career wounds. So, I mean, this is actually written from the perspective of the hire-er, right? It's a company guide. And, and the, the title is the, punch, is the punch line. It's really like, if you want to attract really strong players, heal their career wounds. If you can do that, you've got a win-win situation and you're going to hire the best people. You're going to hire strong people who are going to help you build your organization. So that's, that's pretty much what it is. That's the playbook of it. Um, it's uh, going live on Amazon. It's available for pre-sale. Now I can send you the link. That's pretty much it. All right. So if like, someone wanted to talk to you right now, they said, okay, no, I'm not going to read the book. I want you to come help me. How would they get in touch with you? So you can call me at uh, 949-777-5656. You can what was that? What was that number again? 949-777-5656. All right. You can send me an email at rick at stridesearch.com or you can, uh, you can pop up my website, uh, stridesearch.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's wonderful. Thanks a lot, Rick. This is just, you know, this is just another example of how businesses using people like Rick can thrive in California. You've been listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. To hear more of the programs in this podcast, go to www.willchrist.com.